Welcome everybody to Restoration, whether you're here in the sanctuary with us or listening on the Restoration app or YouTube or through ShalomSeattle.com, however you connect with us. We are glad that you're here. This is the third message in a series called Fence Building and the Slippery Slope. And if you missed the first two, I want to encourage you to go back and get some definition of what these things are. I'm going to uh, uh, do a little bit of repeat to help you understand. In, in Deuteronomy 28, 22 and verse 8, there's a verse that just simply says, it's a commandment for the Jewish people, it, if you have a house with a roof on it, you should put a fence up there. Because if somebody falls off the roof, you'll be responsible if you didn't put a fence there. Super practical, super simple, have a fence. Then we came up with this concept called fence building, which fence building is the idea that based on that verse, you don't want to be responsible for other people breaking commandments. So we put fences up around the commandments to help us keep the commandments. The dilemma is the fences often become commandments even though they were never commanded by God. And then people start to say, well, you have to do this, or it's a sin if you don't do this. But the Torah never instructed those specific things and never called those things sin. So there's a good reason for fences, and the fences are, well, to keep people out or to keep people in. And unintentionally, what happened over the course of time in Judaism is there were so many fences, because you put, you know, one fence, and then you put another fence, and then you put another fence, um, the example I often give is, is there's a verse that says, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. It's like, don't take a baby goat or calf and, and, and cook it in the milk of its mother. It's a very specific. Most commentators will say it was probably a, a pagan um, part of worship for the pagans. And so God, in separating the Jewish people, was separating um, specific things. But so we took that and we said, well, we don't ever want to um, boil a kid in its mother's milk by accident. So we're not going to mix milk and meat. Because if we never mix milk and meat, then we'll never break the commandment of boiling a kid in its mother's milk. Then we said, well, you know, just so we don't ever mix milk and meat, let's never prepare milk and meat together, like ever, in the kitchen. Because if we don't prepare it, then we'll never serve it and we'll never, by accident, boil a kid in its mother's milk. And then they said, well, let's put another fencer. Just to protect it from that, we want to have like separate, we'll keep dairy and meat separate in the fridge, or we'll have separate kitchens, or we'll have separate dishwashers. Let's have separate dishes. And it goes through this whole process of, look, I, I'm not trying to be rude to the rabbis or to anybody I disagree with. I'm just saying, I, I'm like 99.9% .9 sure I've never boiled a calf in its mother's milk. And I don't really need help with that. Because I've never taken the baby animal and took the milk of its mother, which, you know, was a lot more common in the time the commandments were given than they are now. I don't know if you realize that when you go to Costco, they're, they're not like in the same section. You're like, excuse me, I just bought some veal. Could I have the milk of its mother, please? Like, it's, it's very unlikely that that would happen, Right? So the dilemma is those fences then become commandments and then people say, or things that people believe are commandments, and so people will say, well, if you're Jewish and you keep um, kosher, that means you can't milk, mix milk and meat. Well, no, because those are <coughs> extra fences, but there are specific things, and how do we actually keep the specific things? And how do you figure out if the specific commandments are even for you, because there are different commandments for Jews and for Gentiles. There's different commandments for men and for women. There's different commandments for if you're in Jerusalem or you're outside of Jerusalem, if you're in the nation of Israel or outside the nation of Israel. There's commandments that you have to keep when you're a child. There's commandments that you have to keep, a new set of commandments that you have to keep if you become a parent. If you don't become a parent, you don't have to worry about those commandments. Right? There's different times, there's different people, there's different seasons, there's different geography, there's all kinds of things. And a lot of people just want to lump it all together and just say, well, if you're going to keep the commandments, you've got to keep them all. But that's not actually how Judaism has ever really worked. In fact, a lot of people will say the Jewish people prior to Jesus um, believed that by keeping the Torah, you could save yourself. You're going to be really hard-pressed to find any writings that say anything like that. Because that's not actually what the majority of Judaism taught. It's actually the opposite concept. We keep commandments because God loved us first 
And so in an act of love, we want to do what he tells us to do. But he doesn't tell us all to do exactly the same thing. The, the Christian version of the Jewish idea of building fences is the slippery slope. And, and if you grew up in church or you grew up with people around church and people know the Bible, you know that people have probably said something to you along the lines of, well, you got to be careful because if you do that, you're on a slippery slope. And somewhere at the bottom of that slope is an actual commandment. Like the easiest example that comes to my mind is there's nothing in the scripture that says do not drink alcohol. In fact, there's several commandments that tell us to drink alcohol. It's the very opposite. Um, and and, and the, the idea then becomes, well, we, the commandment in the scripture, in the Torah, is do not be drunk with wine. It also repeats itself in the New Testament as well. So what's the difference between having a drink and getting drunk? Well, some of us know because of science that it... it it, um, it's different for each person. It matters how much water you've uh, had. Um, it matters your height and your weight and your size and all of these different things. It's different for each person. So how many drinks and what is drunkenness is a whole different conversation. But people will say and have said, you can't drink anything because if you don't... And I realize that some of you and, and, and plenty of people struggle with alcoholism and that's a totally different thing. Addiction is not good. And if you have anything close to an addiction to it, you should stay away from it. But for those who don't, there isn't a prohibition in Scripture to keep people from drinking alcohol. So we say, well, if you have one drink, that's a slippery slope. Because you're going to like roll down the slope and start having more drinks. And while that could happen, the slippery slope isn't sin. There's a commandment probably at the bottom of that hill that's an actual sin that you should stay away from. Like you should never be drunk which now that it's legal in Washington state, I would also say you shouldn't get high because of the same problem. It, it's, it, it, when you are actually high and you've had something to make you high, you do not remember the things that you do. You are not, as the scripture calls, sober-minded. And if you are not sober-minded, you're going to sin. So be sober-minded is a commandment. So what does sober-minded mean? Well, that's why we come up with fences and slopes because people are honestly trying to answer the questions to protect people, but then the ways that we try to protect ourselves somehow become commandments that God never commanded. Woo! So that brings us to part three of this series. And today, the message is called uh, fences, slopes, and woes. And today on the Jewish calendar is the 28th day of the Omer. It's the 28th day of counting the days between Passover and Shavuot, which means 28 days ago we left Egypt, and 28 days ago Yeshua rose from the dead. Same day. We count these 50 days because the scripture commands us to, and it's the same 50 days that uh, it took for the children of Israel to walk from Egypt to Mount Sinai, and receive the Torah on the day of Shavuot, which this year is Sunday, June 9th. And it's also the same 50 days, 40 of which Yeshua rose from the dead, appeared resurrected to his disciples, and then sent his spirit on the day of Shavuot, which is the same day that the Torah was given. We're going to talk about Shavuot specifically in next week's message, which is part two of, along with this message in a series of four. Very confusing. It makes sense to me, so... Sorry if it doesn't make sense to you. Um, but uh, today we're going to talk about Matthew chapter 23. You can turn to Matthew 23. And, and Yeshua has this famous um, discourse with the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jewish leaders. And, and typically the way that um, these conversations are preached or written about or talked about by other people is it's cased as Yeshua is the good guy, the Pharisees are the bad guy, they don't like each other, and they have arguments, and Yeshua wins. And it's not cased well, because the truth is, what's happening in the first century, and the conversations that Yeshua is having with the Pharisees, are all first century Jewish conversations between all Jewish people. 
These are things that all Jewish people were trying to figure out in the first century. In fact, modern Orthodox Judaism, which everybody pictures, when, you know, depending on where you are in the world, when you say Orthodox Jews, you picture a guy in a black hat with curls in a white shirt and a black jacket. Okay, they've only been dressing that way since the 1800s. They haven't been dressing that way since the first century. And there's reasons why they dress that way. But the, the, the things that developed into what is today modern Orthodox Judaism all start in the time of Yeshua. So the conversations and the arguments about what is Jewishness and what is Judaism and whose authority is to do what and who do we listen to and who, is the one, who are the ones who are actually allowed to interpret what the Torah even means um, and, and what do those interpretations even look like. And, and the rabbis wrote all of these volumes, which we know as the Talmud today, which the conversations begin in the first century to answer some of these questions by building fences and asking the questions, well, you know, if, if the scripture says you can't work on Shabbat, well, we have to define what work is. And we have to define it so that it kind of goes across all the different. So the, the scriptures are clear. The commandment for Shabbat is do not do your ordinary work. So in order to figure out what is ordinary work and define it, the rabbis came up with 39 categories of what work is. Not 39 commandments. 39 categories of commandments, of things that to help people define what work is. That's not a bad thing. Tradition is good because it helps clarify some things and help us understand some things. Um, but it, um, it becomes bad when those things become what you have to do or what you must do. Or if you don't do it the way that you're told, then you're sinning. That's where it actually becomes bad. Tradition's not bad. Tradition's a good thing. Yeshua is not actually against tradition. And I, I'm going to show you this week and next week why he's not actually against tradition. What he's against is calling traditions a commandment. What he's against is somebody saying to somebody else, this is what you must do according to the commandments of God when God never commanded it in the first place. And if you don't do this thing, then you're in sin, except the scripture doesn't call it sin. And, you know, Yeshua... We believe as a Messianic congregation that Yeshua is 100% man and 100% God. And, the, and John says in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He's the one that wrote the Torah and gave the commandments in the first place. So this idea that he would come suddenly and tell everyone all those commandments are gone and no one has to keep them anymore and I'm going to do a totally brand new thing is against the character of God. So, in Matthew 23, and verse 1, this is uh, what Yeshua says. And before that, let me just add this. Often, the fences that we build and the slopes that we fear, because we can blame it on the rabbis all day long, but the truth is, you've built your own fences, and you have your own slopes, and there are things you have to deal with that you're telling people they have to do it the way you do it. Otherwise, they're in sin. You're going to have to wrestle with those things. Because if God didn't call them sin, they're not. But what happens is, often the fences we built, also, if he did call it sin, then it is. <laughs> right? If there's something that God specifically says, this is sin then we do not take the liberty to say, well, we don't really think it's sin. No, we can't do that because God called something sin. But we also can't then add new things that God never said and call them sin. So often the fences that we build and the slopes we fear keep us from actually living out the very things that we say that we believe. The fences and the slopes we tell ourselves are for our good. But actually, and more often, they separate us from understanding why we should be keeping commandments in the first place. And that's why I'm, I'm working so hard to help people and have spent my whole life trying to figure these things out myself and going, oh, maybe it's not as complicated as I've made it because there's too many fences. 
So I was at, at a conference recently, and a guy that I haven't seen for a few years said, you know, you told me this a few years ago. And I said, oh, I don't believe that anymore. And he said, but you believed it very passionately. Yeah, I probably did, but um, I was wrong. <laughs> right? Like, it, the truth is, if you believe the same thing that you believed when you were 20 years old, there's, <laughs> there's something wrong. Okay, they're supposed to move, they're supposed to shift, we're supposed to grow in our knowledge uh, of these things. And we're all in that process, my, myself included. Uh, Matthew 23 verse 1 says, Then Yeshua spoke to the crowds and his disciples, and he said, um, The Torah scholars and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. So whatever they tell you, do and observe. But don't do what they do. For what they say, they do not do. So then he explains the concept. Listen, they tell people to tie up heavy loads that are too hard to carry, and then they lay them on other men's shoulders. They themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to even move them. And all the work they, you got to, I love, man, this is my, like my favorite thing, is everybody's got in their mind, and he is, like Yeshua is this super loving, super patient, super mercy, like all the time, was never bothered by anything. Like, man, I just love you, and I think it's all going to be okay. You know, like he, like he never responded. But, you know, it says he's talking to the people, but we know from the rest of the chapter that the Pharisees and Sadducees that he's talking about are standing right there. And he turns his back, this is the way I view it in my own mind, he turns his back to them and says to all the people standing, these guys are hypocrites. You should do what they tell you to do because they have authority given to them by God. But you shouldn't do what they say because they're all hypocrites and they don't actually do what they tell you to do. Do you think they were like, man, I just love that guy. Like, he's <laughs> something about him. There's something about him. He just seems like a great guy. No, they were angry. Why? Because they were being challenged. Not even, it, it's not, it, people preach this and talk about this as if Yeshua is challenging the Torah and challenging the prophets and challenging ancient Judaism and everything that came before, but he's not challenging any of that. He's saying, do what they say to do, but don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. And it's super easy for us to go, yeah, those hypocrites. Those old timing, old school, old tradition, ancient ways, Jewish leaders that totally made it into something they're not. Man, I'm so glad that I live in a time and a world where we don't do that. But there's all kinds of fences and there's all kinds of slopes that we choose to ignore in the same way these leaders chose to ignore. And it wasn't all of them. This is not a simple, like, the disciples of Yeshua are good and the Pharisees were evil. It's not that simple. Yeshua's not talking about all Pharisees. In fact, he is, theologically speaking, he is closer to a Pharisee than any of the other groups of Jewish people in the first century. He agrees with them more often than with the Sadducees and with the Essenes. He, he agrees more often. Paul is a Pharisee. There's nothing in the New Testament where Paul ever says in his letters, and then I ceased to be a Pharisee because I be converted and became a Christian. It's not what it says. It's not there in the text. Paul and Saul are two names. He's not two different guys that flipped his identity into a different person. These are Jewish people in a Jewish world speaking Hebrew and Aramaic to other people who spoke Hebrew and Aramaic in the land of Israel in the first century. And all of these things were a part of the conversation of what they were all supposed to do. And so Yeshua says, look, they have authority. Or that's for New Yorkers, East Coasters. Or authority for... <laughs> authority or authority. That's the same word. Uh, so the idea that he says to them, they sit on the seat of Moses, in verse 2, says the Torah scholars and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. 
Um, you know, in the third century, second or third century, we have, if you go to the Museum of the Bible in um, Jerusalem, they have one of these seats called the Seat of Moses. And it's actually like a stone seat that would sit in a place where the one who would interpret the Torah and make rulings based on the Torah between two parties would sit in this seat. The only ones we have actually, like physical, are like second or third century. We don't have them from the first century because it was probably still being developed as a concept. It it, it actually comes from Deuteronomy chapter 17 um, and verses 8 to 13, which we have on the screen and you can look up. Um, in, the, in, in your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 17 and uh, verse 8 says this, Suppose a matter arises that is too hard for you to judge over bloodshed, legal claims, or assault, matters of controversy within your gates. You should go up to the place Adonai your God chooses, which is the temple, and come to the Levitical priests, and the judge in charge of the time, and you will inquire, and they will tell you the sentence of judgment. You're to act according to the sentence that they tell you from the place that Adonai chooses, and take care to do all they instruct you. You're to act according to the instruction they teach you, and the judgment they tell you. You must not turn aside from the sentence they tell you to the right or to the left. The man who acts presumptuously by not listening to the priest, who stands to serve there before Adonai your God or to judge, that man must die. So you're to purge the evil from among you. Then all the people will hear and be afraid and not act presumptuously again. It's, it's verses like this that our entire American legal system are built on. The idea that when you have an issue, you bring it to a judge, and the judge, hopefully, judges justly, which we know doesn't always happen. And the instruction is, you you bring the issue to the judge, and the judge will give a ruling, and you must follow that ruling. Kind of like in our system, if you don't follow the ruling of a judge, you could go to jail, right? In this case, die, because... There's a point trying to be made of something from an ancient pagan world that had no instruction where you can do everything you want. God gives instruction to the Jewish people to say, I'm separating you as a people that are different from the nations around you, and you're going to do this differently. And there's going to be priests who sit in a seat of Moses, which later becomes an actual seat. And they're going to be the interpreters of the Torah. And so when you look up in commentaries and things about the seat of Moses, it's, it's literally as if Yeshua is saying to them in, in, uh, in verse 2 of Matthew 23, Yeshua is saying, or 24, Yeshua, uh, 23, sorry. Um, Yeshua is saying, look, the Torah scholars and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. <laughs> He's not saying they don't have any authority. They don't know what they're talking about. Everything they teach is wrong, and I'm coming to fix it and do something brand new. No, he's saying, look, they have authority that I gave them. I gave them authority to rule and to make rulings on my behalf. And the problem is that this particular group of guys who's standing behind me right now, they're terrible at it. It's not all Pharisees, but these guys are hypocrites. And liars, so what they say, you should take heed and actually do, but don't actually do what they do, because you know they're faking it, and they're hypocrites, and they're not actually doing the things that they're instructing the people to do. So, David Stern says in his commentary that they were the official interpreters of the Torah. The difference is that... uh, from the time of Yeshua until now, there's a whole series of decisions that, that, um, that the Pharisees continued to make that Yeshua warned them against before he died and rose from the dead. And he told them things that they would have to shift and things that they would have to do differently. And what the, what, what the Orthodox believe today still is that the, the laws... The oral traditions that become 
three different parts, the mission of the Gemara, which ultimately becomes the Talmud, which is, a, which is you know, commentary after commentary on defining, attempting to define what work is and what the commandments are and who has to keep them and why they have to keep them. And, and none of those things are wrong because they're trying to actually help the people. The part where it became wrong is when they started calling those things sin or not, as if God commanded them. And then literally saying, God commanded them. For instance, the traditional blessing for lighting the Shabbat candles on Friday night is, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the commandment to light the Sabbath candles. There's no commandment to light Sabbath candles. There's a commandment that says, do not kindle a fire on the Sabbath. So the understanding is the Shabbat candles were the last light to be lit before they had electricity. It's totally different for us because we just walk in a room and hit a switch and the lights come on. But for them, if they were going to do anything after sundown, they had to light a last light before the sun went down on Shabbat so that they had light for the rest of that evening. And and so they said, we're going to light the Shabbat candles so that we have light and then anything we want to light, we can light from the Shabbat candles. But then, somewhere along the line, they flipped it and it became who has commanded us to light the Sabbath candles. But he didn't. So do you have to light Sabbath candles? Is it a sin to not light them? No. You can light them. We light them. But we actually changed, and we changed the blessing. The blessing we say in our house, which my mom uh, taught us when we were kids, is blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and has commanded us to be a light to the world. Right? We take the same concept, we alter it a little bit because, well, he didn't command us to light the Sabbath candles. And you can still say that blessing as long as you understand that God didn't actually command it and, not, and that not everyone has to do it. Right? Tradition's not bad. You can do a tradition. You just have to be clear that it's a tradition that you're going to continue to do and that it doesn't become a commandment to the people around you if God actually never commanded it. So Yeshua continues. And really what David Stern says in his commentary about these things, we're going to break into this in a moment, is there is this actual moment kind of through the last three years of, of Yeshua's life and after his death and resurrection and the giving of his spirit on the day of Shavuot, which is only 22 days from today, Um, on the calendar that we're on this year. That when he gave his spirit, there's a process where Yeshua is actually taking the authority that was given to the priests and the rabbis and transferring it to his disciples. Where the disciples become the ones who through their teachings interpret what the Torah means for the followers of Yeshua. And it's why for us as a Messianic community, we don't agree with the Orthodox that the Talmud was given to God, uh, given to, by God to Moses on Mount Sinai and our commandments, but we do believe that the New Testament, the New Testament scriptures, the books that they were inspired by the writers of the New Testament who were all Jews in the same way that the Torah and the prophets were inspired. They continued the same inspiration, and through the Holy Spirit, they became the ones who actually sat in the seat of Moses and of Yeshua, who, by the way, created the seat of Moses because he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so this is not as people typically preach it, which is God finished with ancient Judaism and then started with a new group called Christians, and then those Christians created Christianity, and that's now what God does. No, it's actually a transference of one Jewish group to another Jewish group, and through that Jewish group, they then help the whole world understand. It's why the disciples have a council in the first few years, like 20, somewhere 20 or 25 years after the resurrection. Because somewhere between 10 and 20 years, the only people who believed from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 10, only Jewish people believe in Yeshua for the first 10 to 20 years. And then Peter 
is instructed by the Holy Spirit to go and preach the gospel to Cornelius and his house. And then they have to have a council in Acts 15 where the Jewish disciples get together and ask the question, can a Gentile believe in Yeshua? To which they give an answer, yes. And they stay Gentile. They don't become Jews. And there's just a couple things, a handful of things that they should consider keeping. And in that, they'll understand the rest. But there's a difference between Jews and Gentiles and what we keep and what we do because of how we love God, having nothing to do with salvation. So it, with that in mind, we're going to go back just a few chapters to Matthew 18. And in Matthew 18, Yeshua, in this process of transferring authority from the Sanhedrin to his disciples, this is what he says to them in Matthew 18 and verse 18. He says, I tell you, whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden, and whatever uh, will have been forbidden. in heaven and what you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything, they may ask it, and it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered to, together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So Yeshua was saying to his disciples, look, you have the authority to loose things on earth, to make judgments about commandments, and what you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. What you decide here is the same as what's decided there because I'm making you guys in charge. And then the disciples teach throughout their writings and even from this point that every believer, Peter later says that we are a kingdom of priests and he's, <laughs> he's actually quoting the Torah and the prophets and he's saying we're a kingdom of priests, meaning where in that day priests could only make the decision and sit in the, uh, sit in the seat of Moses. Now all believers are a kingdom of priests and we can forgive each other their sins in the name of Yeshua. We don't have to go to the temple to get a judge to, just ju to judge justly. We can, with the Holy Spirit, judge justly together in community with other people. That we are a kingdom of priests. And so we can, it, when two or three are gathered together, that's where we can make decisions. Which is where it becomes a little problematic because if it's just you, that's not good enough. And if God is just speaking to you, and everyone has to listen to you about the things that God is speaking to you. And there's no community around agreeing that these are the things that we're going to do together as a community. Then you're missing the point. It wasn't just down to one person. It was down to the community walking together. And, and, and this transference that Yeshua is speaking to the disciples about earlier, before it even happens, he's giving them clues to what's coming next, that there's going to be a day where you will judge each other and help each other understand these things. It's funny because right before that, in, 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 um, in Matthew 18 and verse 15, it gives a very specific way of handling conflict. Because when God gives us the authority and the power to deal with conflict... He knows we're going to be terrible at it. So he's like, just in case, I'm going to be super specific on this. So watch Matthew 18, verse 15. Now, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault while you're with him alone. And if he listens to you, then you've won your brother. If he doesn't listen, then take with you one or two more, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the congregation, Messiah's community. And if he, the leaders of the congregation is the indication in the text. And if he refuses to listen even to the community, then let him be to you as a pagan or a tax collector, which I don't know if you realize, Yeshua hung out with tax collectors. Yeah. You remember? So it's a little confusing to say, well, those are the guys you're hanging out with. And he said, no, it's not what they do. It's, it's if, if, if people can't, can't deal with conflict in community, they shouldn't be in community. They can't be. Because you have to deal with conflict in the way that Yeshua tells us to as a kingdom of priests together. 
We're supposed to be able to say where we would have in the past brought a ruling to a priest or a rabbi to ask, what should we do? And you have to do what he says. You do it within community. So if somebody listens, or then you win them. If they don't listen, and of course, it's kind of hard to define whether somebody's listening because listening doesn't mean you agree with each other. It doesn't have to mean that. You can also listen to each other and disagree and be okay with each other in the thing that you're disagreeing about. Or you invite other people. But you guys know, and this is, man, I've been, I, I've, I, I, I have a, um, a relationship outside of the community where I've been dealing with this very thing. And instead of going to the, directly to the person, which I haven't done yet, I talk to a few other people that know that person. Because I just, here's the way I explained it to myself. I just want to make sure that what I'm saying is right. And so I'm going to check it with some other people before I go to the person I have a problem with. Because I just want to make sure, this is a good thing, it's out of the goodness of my own heart, that I want to make sure. And then what happens in process is you say the things you say and you, 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 you gain a hearing from a whole bunch of other people. And then a whole bu- the group of people gets mad together. That's like how, this is how we run as people. Um, and, and instead of doing what Yeshua actually said to do, which is, if you have a problem, just go directly to the person. Even if you're not sure whether they're going to listen to you or not. Even if you're not good at conflict, even if you're afraid of the outcome, even if you're not sure, even if it's difficult, even if all those things are true, you have to go directly to the person. Because if you're sending emails and posting on social media and trying to gain an audience for the person that you're mad at, and I do it, I'm, please hear what I'm saying. I do this too. I know I do. And each time the Lord is saying, I mean, have you ever considered why it's so hard to do the basics? Like we we put all these lofty like things. You know, the problem with the fences and the slopes is they're impossible to do. The 39 categories of what work is are impossible, so much so that the rabbis or priests or the other religious institutions, because it's not just the Jewish people, the Catholic church, the evangelical church, the every church, the independent church, the whatever community we're a part of, we all do the same thing. We make rulings for ourselves that keep us from actually doing the simple thing that we were supposed to do in the first place. We justify under good pretense and under like I'm just it's out of the goodness of my own heart that I'm doing the right thing and we believe it when in the truth is we don't do what we're supposed to do because doing it the right way is much harder it's so much easier to just get everybody all upset at each other rather than to have the conversation Directly, because when those conversations are done well, you win each other over, you forgive each other, you love each other, you run together in the things that God has called you to do. When you don't, it becomes a whole bigger thing. And listen, I've had some conflict recently just in the last couple of weeks, and I'm not directing any of this at any individual. I know people are going to hear it and go, he's totally against me, and he doesn't it's look I I, I, I I believe that it is our responsibility as followers of Yeshua to do what Yeshua tells us to do because he's our rabbi and he has actually given us not just permission he's given us authority to speak into each other's lives and to correct each other and to love each other And I need to be corrected sometimes too. I receive it 
when I need to receive it. Sometimes I get really angry and I make mistakes and I don't receive it. And then the Lord sends me to the hospital and then I have to get better. And then he says, you didn't receive it. And then it's like this whole long thing that's drawn out over like 10 years instead of what I could have just done first, which is what he says to do. But the truth is, often the fences that we build and the slopes that we fear keep us from actually living the very things that we say. I can't tell you how many times in the last month that I have said to someone, you have to go and speak to the person yourself. Thinking I was totally in line with that in every area of my life. Except for this one relationship where I'm not taking my own advice. And it's those moments where growth happens. Because it's easy just to go, you're not doing it right, and you're not doing it right, and you're not doing it right, and I don't care what any of you think. Because none of you are doing it right. When the reality is, you're not doing it right. And it's not a matter of salvation. It's a matter of the kind of follower of Yeshua you actually want to be. You want to be a person. I want to be a person who actually does the things that I say and not just preaches things to other people so that they can get their lives right. I want to get mine right too. And conflict is hard for everyone. And that's why Yeshua says, look, when you have an issue, go directly to the person you have an issue with it. Deal with it head on. Have the difficult conversation. Do it one-on-one. And look, if it doesn't work out, because often it doesn't, sometimes those conversations go awful, that's where you bring in somebody else. It says two or three friends. You bring two or three other people to meet with that person again and say, you know, I'm just, I want to figure it out. So you bring these people together and hopefully it can get figured out that way. If it can't get figured out that way, then you go to the leaders of the congregation and you say, Uh, We've tried this step. We've tried this step. It's still not working. Can you help? Yeah, we'll try to help. And at the end of the process, if somebody can't see something, if if they can't hear, if they, well, the scripture says then don't have anything to do with those people. Why? Because we all have to be willing to face our own hypocrisy. We all have to be willing. I have to be willing. We all have to be willing to say There are so many times where I know what it says and I still don't do it. So should we just throw it all out and go, well, that's because the commandments were impossible to keep. So forget it. Just throw out all the commandments and just do the grace of God. That's not... (laughs) Remember, the Pharisees are standing there. And Yeshua says, these guys are liars. They are hypocrites. What they say is true. You should do it. But don't do what they do. And then he gives what we're going to do next week, which is what are the seven woes that he accuses the Pharisees of. And what you're going to find, as I've found in studying these things, is you could just call them the seven woes of you, not just the seven woes of the Pharisees. Because what's true for me is true for you, is true for every person on the planet, whether we know Yeshua, follow Yeshua, or are on a way to knowing Yeshua, or refuse to believe in him at all. There are good and healthy ways to keep commandments. But some of us are so focused on the way that we judge each other in the way that we keep the minor things that we're actually missing the weightier things of the commandments, like justice and mercy and compassion and correction, and rebuke, and all of these things that are important in the context of relationship and community. Because we just want to argue whether you're eating the right food, or whether you have a Christmas tree or you don't, or what day you keep the Sabbath, or what holidays you keep or don't keep, or whose pagan thing is other person's pagan thing. And in the meantime, we're not actually doing 
the weightier matters of the law, which are love and mercy and compassion and rebuke and confrontation in a healthy way and speaking truth and love into the lives of each other. And I think if we can actually wrestle these things, I can't even imagine what the Lord could do in a place that deals with these things in a healthy way and refuses to do it the way that we've always done it, but to try to fix it and ask the Lord to be in it and help us to keep his commandments. Fences and slopes aren't bad. Tradition's not bad. But when we use those things to judge each other on the issues that matter far less than the things that God actually wants us to do, that matters a lot and should matter a whole lot more. Let me pray for you. Avita Malkano, our Father and our King, Lord, we thank you for who you are and who you've called us to be as a people. We love you, Lord. And we want to be people that keep commandments because you love us and it's a way to love you back. Not because we earn anything by the things that we do, but because in your grace and mercy, you did what we couldn't do. You kept it all perfectly. So that in our imperfecting, in our ways of keeping the commandments imperfectly, you offer all the things that we need within community for each other. Lord, would you help us to be aware of the fences and the slopes? And would you help us to be aware of the places that we need to shift ourselves? Not just where everyone else needs to change and everyone else needs to shift, but where I need to shift on my own through your Holy Spirit and in relationship to other people. We trust that you're going to do it because you promised to never leave us or forsake us. And even though we're terrible at doing the things that you've asked us to do, that promise still stands. You will not leave us. You will not give up on us. And for that, we can only be eternally grateful because how frustrating we must be. But your love and your grace and your mercy is so much bigger and better than what we offer ourselves and each other. And we're grateful for that. We love you, Lord. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Can we all stand together?